Okay, we are uh, studying this month and month of December. It's a part of this class, junior high, senior high, and all adults are in here on Sundays and Wednesdays and talking about this topic of my church family. When you think of my church family, when you think of your church family, what do you think of? What does that, what, what do those three words, what does that draw to mind? My church family. There's three words there. You've got the word church that sounds awfully religious because that's the only context we ever use it in. You've got the word family, which indicates that this is more than just some organization. This is something that's very personal. Uh, this is something that's uh, uh, going to deal with, with something I understand, and that's the family. Then you've got that personal pronoun. It's my church family. It's not just a church family. It's not just the church family. Both of those are accurate terms. But it's my. It's my church family. We've talked about the fact that this church family, we are all a part of this family by birth. We all got in it the same way. By faith and by birth, we are members of that family. And once we are a part of that family, Galatians chapter 3 says, we are a part of that family without distinction. It's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. We are part of that family not just by birth, but we talked about Wednesday night, by birth and by adoption. And when we are born into Christ, when we are adopted by God to be one of His children, we all become a part of that family that has as its one goal, Christ. Here's where we left off Wednesday night, and I want to finish these four points and then move on to how we treat each other uh, like Jesus, uh, like we would even treat Jesus. Here, here's four thoughts I want us to think about regard to the church family. Number one, we talked about this. The church family wants everybody to be a part of it, without exception. Do you want everybody to be a part of your church family? Are there some people that you, you could take them or leave them? You know, when you usually say that, take it or leave it, it you, you usually already have in mind which one you're going to do. Uh, could, are there some people that you, you could take it or leave it whether they make it in the family or not? There's some, in, there's some outsiders there's, that need to be in the family. There's some insiders need to be in the family. There's some little children we need to focus on. Do we want everybody in our family? And this was the last point we looked at Wednesday night before time got us, and that is that the family of God gives everybody in that family a sense of belonging. Now let me ask this question, whose job is that? Whose job is it in the family to make everybody else in the family to feel like they belong? It's everybody's job? Are you sure? You know what we tend to do when we say it's everybody's job? Let somebody else do it. If it's everybody's job... You all do it. i got other things to do. Is it everybody's job? Yeah, it is. And so what do we tend to do? We tend to not do our part of that job. You get the, the Great Commission, whose job is that? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to everybody you meet. Whose job is that? Everybody's. You know what we do when the job is everybody else's job? Well, it's everybody else's job. It's not my, I'll let them take care of it. Making everybody in the family feel like they belong. Some of you have moved in to this area um, from other places. And you become a part of this congregation. And some of you have felt the difficulty of breaking in, breaking through in the building of relationships with the church. Because you come, you come to a family, 
You come to a family like this and there's relationships that already exist. And now here's an outsider who moves in and, oh, well, you're, 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 not, you're not one of us. You, you, you're a little different. You, 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 we're we're going to wait and see who you are and how you, how you uh, behave before we bring you in. Some of you who've been baptized here. Somebody taught you the gospel. You were baptized into Christ. Maybe in, maybe in this baptistry, maybe over on 36th Street, maybe just in a pool, somebody's home. But it's taken you a while to feel like you belong. Why does that happen? Honestly, let's be honest. Why does that happen? Yes, sir. Okay, sometimes that happens. Sometimes, uh, Bill says, sometimes it's not the ones who are already here, but sometimes it's the ones who move in or the new ones who, who isolate themselves from the family. That's tough. You move into a family, you move into a new area, it's tough to be the, the one who's outgoing. It's tough to be the one who's going to break through and is going to be the one who builds the relationships. Why is that hard? Fear of failure. Fear of failure. Okay, Mickey? Um, maybe among names and things like that. I think it has a lot to do with attitudes on both sides. Emily was here, and I mean, she jumped right in and worked with the family. Because she was someone that was really fast. I mean, I learned a lot from her. Most people don't believe it about me, but my personality is extremely shy. I'm not comfortable in huge groups. And I've learned a lot. That's a great. That's a great, great point. Great example, and it, and it ties in with, um, with, with what Bill said, that that sometimes those who are moving in, you know, Bill said that sometimes they isolate themselves, and Mickey gives the example of somebody else who who just from the moment she arrived, you know, started coming to Tuesday Tuesday morning Bible classes, started bringing food to Tuesday morning Bible classes, started, uh, you know, looking for opportunities to be involved. Tasha. Tasha says it's going to require both, both sides to get out of their comfort zone. But we like our comfort zone. It's comfortable. That's why we're there. How do we get out of there? I mean, if, if, if you had the option of sitting in your easy chair all reclined or sitting on the tile floor, hello, how do you get out of your comfort zone? How do you move... And go talk to somebody who you don't know, who's a little different, whose who's, who's appearance, whose hair, whose clothes, whose whatever is just not your style. How do you make people feel like they belong? Is this a challenge? Is this why we don't have any answers? Um, how do we make people feel like they belong? Mickey? Okay. All right. Go, go, go sit next to them. Invite them into your home. Yes, Joanne. Okay. Okay.
Okay. Yeah. So you, we've got, uh, we need to, again, break out of the comfort zone, invite them over, invite them to go out to eat, go, uh, go find ways to meet people, to get to know them, to let them get to know you. Uh, and and the, while, while there is a burden upon those individuals, those new individuals who come in to do that as well, there is a greater burden. Uh, yes, sir. There, Gary talks about the responsibility, talks about the incentive. What is our incentive for doing it? It's to get us to heaven. It's our Christian duty to help each other get to heaven. Peggy? Right, absolutely. So Pe Peggy, Peggy says it's beyond just meeting people here at services, but uh, you think about when, when, you pick up, when you pick up an announcement sheet and it has activities listed inside of it, why are those planned? Are those planned just so that we can put something on a calendar so that we can have something to announce at the beginning of service because we don't want it to look like we have nothing going on, so we'll just put a lot of stuff together to make it look like we're busy. Uh, why are there things planned for all of these different groups? Why are there congregation-wide activities? And as Peggy says, those are great opportunities to meet people uh, in, in, a, uh, in, in, a, in a way, in a, in a setting that's non-threatening, that's easy to get to know people. Let, look, let, let's look in Galatians chapter 3. Get, get to a couple passages here. I want us to get on to this, uh, 
to this third point of not only does God want us to want everybody in the family and, and to give everybody a sense of belonging, there's a couple other things that tie into this. But look in, uh, look in Galatians chapter 3. And uh, somebody who has a new American standard. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29. Galatians 3 and verse 29. Read just the first part of that. Somebody who's got a new American standard. And if you you do what? If you belong to Christ. Do you belong to Christ? The, The New King James says, if you are Christ's. And puts it in the possessive, which the New American Standard puts the word belong in there. If you belong to Christ, then the verse says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, bond nor free, we are all one. If you belong, do you belong to Christ? Look in chapter 5, verse 24. Do you belong to Christ? Look in chapter 5, verse 24. Phil, read that verse. Those who belong to Christ. What does that mean? What does that mean to belong to somebody, something? Ownership. There's ownership. We belong to Christ. Now, somebody who has... Uh, look over in Romans chapter, uh, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 5. The New King James, and I want to know if you have something different, significant to our discussion in this verse. Romans chapter 12 and verse 5. So we, being many, are one body in Christ. Here's the section I want you to concentrate on. We've talked about being one body in Christ. And individually, here's four words. In the New King James, individually, as as a collective whole, we are one body. Individually, what is our relationship to each other? New King James says, individually, we are members of one another. Somebody have a translation that has a different word there that ties in with what we just saw in the book of Galatians. Say it again. Individually, we belong to one another. Individually, we are members of one another. We belong to each other. What kind of relationship do you have with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you look at it as I belong to Christ and we belong to each other? Members of one another. What does that mean? I need to feel like I belong and I need to make you feel like you belong. Does that mean that you're going to have an equal uh, relationship with 400 people in this congregation? That's going to cost you a lot of meals if you're going to have an equal relationship with 400 people. Does that mean you will have a closer relationship with some people than you will with others? Did Jesus have a closer relationship with some people than he did with others? Yes. But here's the question. Are there some people in this congregation whom you have seen who you think they might not have a relationship with anybody in this congregation? They, 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 may, they may not They may not be friends with anybody here. You might see them come in at 10.05, five minutes after 10, and leave at five minutes before 11, get here late, leave early. They They don't mix. They don't mingle during services. And for sure, they don't come to any other activities. They don't have a relationship with anybody else in the church. And if you can think of 
if you can think of one person, one member, one couple, one family in this church who you would say, you know, I don't know that they've got a relationship with anybody. Is there anything you can do today about that? Somebody had their uh, Fran and then Tracy. <laughs> Well, God, God gave each of us a free will, didn't he? And uh, as Fran says, there's some folks who are, who are just not going to want uh, that relationship. And uh, uh, they're not going to want that closeness. And, and that's their choice. And yet, do we get to make that decision for them? Do we get to say, oh, you know, I don't really think you're the, you're the close-knit relationship type. I just, you know, it, you just don't strike me as that. I don't, they can make that decision for themselves, but not we for them. Tracy and then Trina. Um, I was going to say kind of along with what Fran was saying. We do have people who leave the church in many, maybe not necessarily this group, but two very different, distinct ways. There are those of us who feel the church is my family, and we feel that sense of belonging because we've immersed ourselves in it, and we are a part of this group, and we feel like it's family. Then you have people who feel like going to church Trina? Are, are there people sitting here right now that we don't know what's going on in their lives? Let's see. That would be everybody, wouldn't it? Uh, do you know everything that's going on in everybody else's lives around here? No. Do you know everybody who's hurting right now? Do you know why they're hurting? Uh, not a clue. Not until we sit down. Uh, not until we learn to listen. Not until we learn to support each other. Fran and then Kathy.
Good, good. Kathy? It's interesting to hear all of these comments, and, and they're, you know, it all centers around the same concept uh, of getting out. Sorry, Sue, I did see your hand, and then I forgot I saw your hand. Getting out and, and finding opportunities. Um, you know, that, that's, why, that's one of the reasons that we print a church directory. Not just so you can get in touch with somebody in an emergency. Not just so you can call Mike Erickson when your fish is sick and say, Mike, my fish is sick, what do I do? And now you've got his phone number to call. It, it's, it, that's, if anybody, by the way, if anybody's got a sick fish, it's 3109916. But, uh, um, um, sorry, Mike, that, it's 561 area code for those of you who are listening in some other part of the country. Um, but uh, 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 but it, it's, it's, a, it's, the directory is an opportunity uh, to, uh, Especially with the photos in there to flip through and find people. You know, I don't know who that is. And, uh, and to see what you can do to make a difference. Sue? Along that line, those photos, if you don't know who they are, they have the birthday listed and an anniversary listed. Yes, they have a birthday and an anniversary listed in there, too. Right, right, right. And, and, that's, and that's just a, a sim, offering a simple uh, welcome and, and greeting and good morning, uh, not asking them, as Sue says, where they're from, because uh, they say, well, I just live a few streets over from you. I've been a member here just as long, um, but, uh, but being mindful of those who are around you. Uh, let, let me share a couple more thoughts before time runs out. And, and these, le- these last two are, are very similar to what we've already talked about. Church family not only tries to give each person a sense of belonging, but a church family accepts each member despite the fact that they're adopted. I did not grow up in a family that had anybody who was adopted. Some of you have. And I would imagine, although some people are very gifted and natural and good at this, uh, but I would imagine for, for some folks, if there's somebody in the family who's adopted, that just may come out every once in a while. It may just, you know, that you may treat them just a little touch differently. And again, I'm, I'm speculating because I, I haven't been in one of those families. But for somebody who is not one of us, do you accept them despite the fact they're not one of us? Who in here is adopted into the family of God? Everybody. None of us belong. None of us fit in. You have Jesus as your older brother. Did you have an older brother growing up that you just couldn't measure up to? Did you have an older... No, no, Gary didn't. Did you have an older sister? Uh, Did you have an older sibling? Or maybe you were the older one that you set the bar and nobody else even tried. You know, they couldn't touch you. As brothers and sisters in Christ, do we have an older brother who just far uh, surpasses any level of, of perfection that we, we we're not going to reach, we're not going to attain the level of Christ, are we? I, I, I just, I don't, you know, if, if you put Christ in the mix, none of us fit in. 
We're all adopted. And yet, how accepting are we of each other? How accepting are we? What happens? Answer this question for me. What happens if somebody is adopted into a family and then they're never made to feel a part of that family? And they are always reminded, whether it be verbally or non-verbally, they're always reminded, you know, you're adopted. You're not really a part of this family. And they are held at arm's length, not really brought into that inner relationship and inner circle. What happens for somebody in a family who's treated that way? Tommy, what would you say? They may develop mental disorders. They go away. Isn't that the natural thing to do? If you are not wanted somewhere, what are you going to do? Are you going to keep going back? If, if you are not made to feel a part of the group, what are you going to do? You're going to keep going back? If you are not accepted for who you are, if you're not accepted, even though you're adopted and you look a little bit different. Mark Blackwelder, who was here for our uh, lectureship, was a, uh, was a missionary in, uh, uh, was it Yugoslavia? Somebody, uh, I think it's Yugoslavia. I can't remember exactly. One of the Slavias. Um, he and his wife were missionaries in Yugoslavia for about 10 years. Their 16-year-old, I think she's 16 or 17 years old now, daughter, was adopted while they were missionaries. You think she looks anything like Mark and his family? Not a thing. Her appearance is different. She stands about that tall at 16 or 17 years old. She not only looks different in, in, in her hair color, in her skin color, in her height, she, she just doesn't look a part of that family. What if she was constantly reminded about that? Boy, you're, you're, just, you're just different, aren't you? You don't look like us. You don't act like us. If you treat somebody like they don't belong, eventually they are going to leave. They are going to go away. Should we be surprised sometimes when brothers and sisters in Christ fall away and one of the reasons, now recognize, Everybody has free will and God puts responsibility on each one to remain faithful. And so there is the, the, the primary responsibility is on that person to remain faithful to God. But if we don't do something to make somebody feel like they are accepted, should it, should it surprise us? Should it surprise us when we treat our young people when we treat our teenagers, when we treat our children like they are, well, you'll be something in the church one of these days. You'll make a difference in the church one of these years. We'll, 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 make, we'll, we'll bring you in and make you feel a part of, of, of the bigger family when you grow up and, you know, when, when, when you get a little older. If we continue to hold somebody at arm's length, even up until the time that they graduate from high school. Should it surprise us that when they graduate from high school and they go off on their own, that we never see them again? Because we never brought them into, not just in words, but in reality, we never brought them into the family. 
We never accepted them as one of us. Mary, did you have your hand up or... It, 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 can ha- it can happen anywhere, and, and it can happen in, in any number of circumstances. And yet here we are, every one of us adopted, and yet in God's eyes we're all equal. We're all necessary. We, we are all wanted by God. The question is, are we wanted by each other? Let me share with you one final point. And that is the family of God loves each member despite the fact that they are imperfect and annoying. Don't point any fingers, just think in your head. Is there somebody in this church who might be imperfect and or annoying? Don't point fingers. Don't they just drive you crazy? Don't you wish you could just shake them and say, hey, be more like me. Apparently I'm the only one that has that sensation. Are there people in this family that are less than perfect, who have flaws? Are there people in this family who the way they think is just warped? I mean, the, the, way, the way their mind works the way, it is just backwards. Are there people in this family who annoying is a nice way to talk about them? Should we love them? You know why we should love them? Because their Father in heaven loves them. Despite all of their imperfections, God loves them as much as He loves you with all of your perfections. Despite all of their annoyances, God loves them as much as He loves you and all of your glory. There's a song that says, We're part of a family. And that's what this is about. My church family. And I don't know if some of you, there's some in here who are not a part of the church family. And we long for you to be a part of the church family. There are some who have been a part of this church family from its beginning. Some of you. You go all the way back to 33 A.D. Some of you are looking pretty good. Uh, Some of you are looking pretty good. And there's some who were just baptized this year. And God took all of us and He put us in the kingdom. That's one way to talk about it. He put us in the body. That's another way to talk about it. He put us in the vineyard. That's another way to talk about it. He put us in the army. It's another way to look at it. And he put us in the family so that we would build relationships with each other for one common goal. And this is what Gary said. One common goal. We are all trying to get to heaven together without the loss of a single person. Thank you all for your good attention, your good participation this morning. We will get in more specifically to what we uh, had as the title of this lesson, How Can I Treat Other People Like I Would Treat Jesus? We'll talk about that Wednesday night. you got to be here Wednesday night. Don't miss it.